Thank you, Lynn. Welcome to all of you. Thank you all for being here. I'm especially glad uh, my granddaughter is in the audience today. She doesn't have to be here, and I'm really glad she's here. And I want to thank also Jessica Bailey, who is um, the person at the college who is in charge of the REACH project, and she's a dear friend and former colleague of mine from, from the time when I worked there. Happy to have her and happy to share in this experience with her. Well, you know, the story of Arkansas is told in many, many places across the state. The colonial, the colonial story is told at Arkansas Post. The story of the surveying of the new lands of the 1803 Louisiana Purchase originates from a swamp in southeast Arkansas. And Little Rock tells the founding of the capital city uh, in uh, the 1820s. Now, very importantly, the 200-year-old history of settlement in the 11 Point River Valley is now coming into focus. Yeoman farmers, along with a few African American slaves, actually arrived in this valley prior to 1815. In 1803, the region's earliest known Anglo settlers, accompanied by enslaved African Americans, first forded the blue green river waters of the 11 Point. They first hunted the plentiful bear, the deer, the foxes, all the wildlife. And they first staked claim to the rich soils in the 11 Point River Valley in what is today a part of Randolph County in Northeast Arkansas. William Looney and those African Americans who are believed to have accompanied him from their home in the Holston River Valley of what was then, or of what is now East Tennessee, were among the frontier settlers who formed one strand of the Trans-Mississippi West migration of those settlers. Most of them of Scotch-Irish descent, people who pushed westward in quest of new opportunities. These were opportunities encouraged by a young government eager to populate and develop the newly acquired territory that doubled the land mass we now call the United States of America. They were following typical migration patterns, which generally find young single men exploring new areas, areas not alone, singly, but as part as a group. This was considered the first frontier, and it was an exploitative frontier. These men hunted or mined, worked as surveyors, and found the land that they wanted to settle. They then returned home and came back to the new land with a family. Indeed, the early settlement in this part of the state, in the 11 Point River Valley, seemingly followed this very typical pattern. As early as 1800, Americans were entering the Osage Indian hunting grounds in the upper reaches of the 11 Point. By an 1808 treaty, the Osage relinquished their hunting rights. Relinquished might not be <laughs> the proper term, but the... Um, I guess it will do, um, relinquished their hunting rights in the area and moved further west. And this helped to clear the way for the settlement by the first wave of Anglo-American and African-American families streaming across the Mississippi River in rather large numbers. It's unlikely that any permanent homesteads were established in the valley until after this treaty was enacted. Looney and his entourage would return home and in time return then with news of their discoveries. And this would, of course, prompt their friends and their kinsmen to plan and then, when the time was right, to undertake the journey for themselves. Certainly, by 1812, when a wagon train of men, women, and children followed the trail that Looney had blazed. Now, by 1815, William Looney and his friend and kinsman, Reuben Rice, were well established in the 11 Point River Valley. Reuben Rice would take the part of the country merchant supplying the growing community with items that were not readily available and offering for purchase or barter at his rural trade center many of the things that he and his family were proficient in producing, such as these items listed here. Looney, in contrast, built his place about 
a mile distant as the crow flies and on the opposite side of the river. His would become one of the largest farmsteads in the Eleven Point River Valley and he would utilize a number of enslaved African Americans to help build his extensive holdings and so the earliest seedbed of agricultural heritage that continues in Randolph County today. The first land surveys conducted by the, the General Land Office, the GLOs, in the area along the 11 point did not begin now until 1817. Numerous families were already well established in the valley by the time of these initial surveys. And unfortunately, uh, those first surveyors were instructed not to take the time to record the settlements and roads, just hurry up and get the surveys done so the government could hurry up and sell the lands. Later surveys would indicate roads and settlements if they were located nearby. The earliest date when the Davidson Township residents could file for patents on their land was 1822. By that time, many families had already been there for a decade or more. Reuben Rice and William Looney were among the many other residents who had filed preemptions for their homesteads, which indicated <sighs> As soon as that land was available for sale, they were buying it. Their patents for their land were granted in 1823, and both of these men actually filed patents for the land where the extant log structures that the college has restored are located. The Rural Trade Center, built by Reuben Rice in 1828, and William Looney's large two-story dog trot believed to have served as his distillery and possibly as a tavern or inn built just five years later, are among the oldest extant log structures of their types in the state of Arkansas, as far as we know today. They've been painstakingly restored on their original sites, the grant-funded culmination of Black River Technical College's Project REACH, which as you know is researching early Arkansas cultural heritage and it uses historical, archaeological, and architectural research, bolstered, though, by family tradition and by hundreds, thousands of pieces of archival evidence. We've learned a great deal. We've acquired a lot more understanding of the history and of the non-plantation role played by enslaved African Americans uh, prior to, particularly prior to the Civil War. Though there is so much more work and so much more research, and I hope some of you out here in the audience are people who may take on the work going forward. So let's look at the project itself and how it unfolded. First of all, standing about a mile apart, as I said, on opposite sides of the river in the gentle sloping hills of northeastern Arkansas, are these two historic structures. They came so close, so close to disappearing forever from the fertile valley where they've stood sentinel for nearly 200 years. And you know, most people would not have really noticed their disappearance, but we would have lost a real treasure if that had happened. Not just the tangible physical elements, but also those intangible valuable aspects of our history that include the stories of the settlements and of the people, of the Anglo-Americans and the enslaved people, who had left their homes in the Holston River Valley of Tennessee to make that journey into this verdant wilderness in the wake of the Louisiana Purchase. These two structures, the, the Rice Up Shaw House and the William Looney Tavern, are named in honor of the pioneering individuals who built them during Arkansas's territorial era. When Black River Technical College first became of the, aware of the structures, both of them were sheathed in outer fabric, outer coverings, which in effect maybe helped preserve them as well as um, disguised what we were dealing with. There were layers and layers and layers of siding and all kinds of other materials added through the years. Both structures at this point had been vacant, vacant for more than 30 years. Deterioration, as you can see here, was quite widespread. And in both instances, immediate stabilization was important 
if these houses or if these structures were ever to be restored. Well, at that time, in 2002, very few people at Black River Technical College or in Randolph County could have really imagined that either of these structures could ever be restored. But one person had a very clear vision of how this could all happen. She is historic preservationist Joan Gould of Fayetteville. Any of you know Joan? Well, I hope you have a chance to know her. She's, she's terrific. The number of believers also included um, the owners of the structures. And this is where it gets really interesting. The owners of the structures were descendants of the families who had built them. How unusual, how unique is it that a structure will remain in the ownership of the same family for 200 years? And they had, they had stories, they had family knowledge, intimate knowledge of the history of these houses. And um, they, they had done all they could up to this point to preserve the structures on the original spots. But, but they, they realized at this point that absent drastic intervention in the form of a total re restoration, which was something they knew they could not afford, the houses would literally soon fall down. About that time, Gould, John Gould was working on the early Arkansas settlement study, which included, Joan is just one of these people, and she will tell you, uh, the, the lady here was saying she never met a museum that she didn't like. Joan never met, never met a log structure that she didn't like. Now that's just Joan. And she contacted the college, the RTC, with a request as, and an invitation. Serve as an educational partner, she said, with us in the EASS. Well, because my duties at the time included grant writing as well as a, a faculty member, they sent Joan to my office. I seemed to be the place where they used to send people they didn't know what else to do with. So anyway, as a faculty member in the English department, I could, I could see that a partnership like this might be beneficial to students because, you know, uh, students have to write about something. They don't just write in a vacuum. And I thought, oh, okay, we could probably work this into some writing assignments. And I recruited a fellow faculty member who agreed to participate. It wasn't going to cost us anything. And so I invited her to come and speak to the students and kind of pique their interest. Then we spent an entire day, a Saturday, at the sites. And the students were just enthralled. While they were there, they actually got to observe and talk with uh, Dr. Dave Staley, a dendrochronologist, and other investigators. And they clamored about the fragile old houses, read the yellowed old newspapers that were covering the cracks in the walls, and, and having a great time going up and down that winder, uh, winder stair is what that's called, I believe. And their enthusiasm was remarkable. They then completed one of their essay assignments where they were asked to write using, you know, one of the rhetorical modes, compare and contrast or something like that. Anyway, they came up with essays and writings and I was struck by the outcome. In fact, uh, the, we, we used excerpts of some of these essays on the, on the materials uh, later for grant applications and other purposes. And you can see that they were they were touched. I love the way Twyla Evans put that about um, they are beckoning us to dig deeper into their past and give them a solid place in history. Well, also, in addition to the English students, students in a graphic arts class designed what would eventually become the uh, master plan for REACH, and still others in the drawing class went out to sketch the structure and their engagement too was unmistakable. And I'm sure that the, the plein air experience enhanced the quality of their work. Uh, as you can see this student here and then here are uh, other images of some of the work of those very first art students. It was, you know, it's what you know as, a, as, a, as an educator. You connect learning to life and, and that, makes it, that makes it happen. This early Arkansas settlement study accomplished many things, major feats. First of all, 
it determined that those two structures, because the dendrochronology was a part of that, and it determined that those two structures were as old as the family's oral traditions had told us that they were. Well, that gave us a bit of confidence. You know, these, these family descendants, they kind of know their stuff when it comes to these houses. And it also showed us that linking classroom theory to a project of historic preservation is not just a possibility, but maybe it's a highly positive thing to do as well. So given the outcome of this study, Gould's next steps, and by now I was, I was hooked, I was on board, <laughs> were to pers persuade both BRTC and the property owners that restoration would be possible if both were in agreement on how to move forward toward the goal. This would require that BRTC seek grant funding for further historic, architectural, archaeological research from the Arkansas Natural and Cultural Resources Council. To be eligible for an ANCRC grant, many of you probably are aware of this, um, the property must be owned by the state. So the college would have to be willing to assume ownership, and that meant the families who for so many years had stewarded the structures, the homes of their ancestors, they would now have to relinquish ownership in order to save them. So the owners had to be willing to deed over ownership to the college, and the college had to be willing to take it on and restore it. Now given the state of dilapidation and the lack of experience that we had in historic preservation, this really did require a major leap of faith by the college. And you can look at the interior and, and kind of get a, an idea about that. College administrators and board members were pretty skeptical, but not totally unsupportive. They could see the possibilities, first and foremost, to benefit the students with a lab type setting. And they realized that the project might hold potential for the promotion of heritage tourism to our region and economic development is a part of the college's mission. So they began to see this, this might work. So with assurances that the restoration, if it occurred, would be financed by grants, the college said yes, we will accept ownership and we will restore it if grants are received. And the family owners said Yes, we will deed the properties if the college will use them as educational and lab settings. So the project then officially became known as uh, Project REACH, and we did apply to the ANCRC for a planning and stabilization grant initially, followed by a construction grant for restoration of the Rice Upshaw House, uh, subsequent grants brought funding for the William Looney Tavern, uh, construction of a pavilion, fencing, parking, handicapped accessible walkways, restoration of outbuildings at Rice Upshaw, and, and finally a small pavilion at the Looney Tavern, as well as interpretive signage and uh, material artifacts. I'm hesitant to call them furnishings because these structures are not furnished in the conventional sense but there are a few items, as, as you'll see. So BRTC feels extremely, extremely grateful. These are very competitive grants if you've ever worked with ANCRC. We feel very lucky to have received um, what totals approximately $2 million in grants for the REACH project to include not just the physical construction, but also the historical and the archaeological and architectural research and those elements. So who, who are these pioneering settlers who built these structures? We have learned a, a good bit about them. We're going to begin with Reuben Rice, the builder of the older of the two structures, even though William Looney actually was the first to be in the Eleven Point River Valley. But we'll begin with Reuben Rice, one of the region's country merchants, he became a leading citizen of this fledgling community. He was born in 76 and was 36 when, when he arrived at the site with his sons, John, William, and Ezekiel. 
They came in a wagon train about 1812 with a large group of other people, friends, neighbors, kinsmen from, from their area. And then three more sons, Samuel, Jenkins, and Thomas were born in the valley. Uh, given the family's arrival date around 1812, the Dendro chronology established construction date of 1828, now think about this, uh, points to the fact that this building did not serve as the uh, dwelling place for the family originally. You'll hear, you'll hear more about this later. In fact, we do not know the exact location of the Reuben Rice dwelling place from, the, from their arrival date. What we do know is that Reuben Rice and William Looney were neighbors, kinsmen in Tennessee, in present day Tennessee, before they settled in the 11 Point River Valley. Reuben Rice's entrepreneurial spirit was, spirit was very obvious as he built and established a trade center in this log structure that we have restored. In fact, um, his place was so well known, it's referred to in a great many documents, many, many places, simply as Reuben Rice's. You know, like we would say, well, we would say, what, <coughs> Walmart, or, you know, it was, it was a well-known place, without, without question. And such trade centers were common away from the more um, larger trade commercial centers. Its location near what became the military road also helped to guarantee the success of the enterprises, which were many, as uh, you see listed here. Reuben Rice himself was illiterate, and he became a student of one of his sons, William. And uh, in fact, uh, he sometimes signed his name only with an R and sometimes in this way. But this status of being illiterate did not prevent the man from assuming quite a leadership role in the valley. Um, elections were held there. He, he was an election commissioner of sorts. In fact, his is one of the three commissioners whose names appear on the um, document that confirms Pocahontas as the county seat for Randolph County. Um, records indicate to us that he only ever owned one enslaved person, and family lore has it that he did not agree with slavery. He administered the estates of many of his neighbors, and uh, at his trade center, people would have bartered for thread, for calico, shaving soap, sugar, tabasco, uh, tobacco, whiskey, and other items. And you see here exhibitry that we have recently been able to add that include those kind of items or uh, uh, receptacles where they would have been sold, including this chest and, and other items. In addition to this, today's visitors get to practice restringing the rope bed. You've heard the expression, maybe you haven't, but I grew up hearing sleep tight and don't let the bed bugs bite. And it has everything to do with tightening, tightening the ropes. This is a replica of, an, of the original rope bed, which we also have as a part of this project. Um, among the neighboring artisans and craftsmen in the 11 Point River Valley in the 1820s, were these people, and you can see they're very, very technically skilled artisans and craftsmen. Through our extensive, extensive research, we learned also that in the 1840s, Reuben Rice's two-room shop evolved. It had begun as a one-story, tiny little piece place, and it evolved into a two-story, uh, two-room dwelling place for one of Reuben Rice's sons, Thomas Blackman Rice. During this time frame, lots of activity was also in progress on the other side of the 11 Point River, and I have no doubt that William Looney was right in the middle of it. He was a son-in-law of William Stubblefield Sr., who is considered uh, generally to be the patriarch of that entire migrant group from Hawkins County, Tennessee. According to oral tradition, William Looney first arrived 1803 as a 17-year-old. 
and he um, he brought with him, uh, according to family lore, three African American slaves. We've not been able to document or prove this, but it is definitely the family's tradition that this was his experience. Um, the date then when he, he returned home and then later returned, we don't have evidence that he was on that 1812 wagon train. We only know that by 1815, he had claimed as his own certain parcels of land, including one significant portion on the west side of the river, uh, again, about a mile distant from Reuben Rice's place as the crow flies. And then he served as a justice of the peace um, he was quite a, quite a mover and shaker, apparently. He was already married and the father of ten children. He married Rhoda Stubblefield. Just as his family um, had held leadership positions back home in Tennessee, I mean, there are ferries and uh, landmarks named after the Looney family all over the place. They had been very prominent people there. Well, he assumed leadership roles here also. And um, it indicates that he was a very wealthy, very influential yeoman farmer. He was a road commissioner. And he was the community's banker of sorts, or financier. At some point, this is maybe the thing that captures the imagination of so many of us, at some point, he planted a substantial apple orchard. As suggested by his probate records, he was probably operating a tavern or an inn, ostensibly for, for travelers on the river. Um, and this is what has led to the belief that this structure was likely used as a tavern or an inn for, for the travelers in part, and the other part of it is the site of his distillery, we believe. Uh, probate documents show accounts that um, he had far more beds than would have been common for a family in, in that day. He also had many more tubs, stills, and uh, other material needed for distilling than other probates of other families. And distilling was done by pretty much most of those families, but he had huge quantities of those items, which also um, triangulates well with the family's uh, stories that he was a, uh, ran a distillery. Well, once again, as is the case with Reuben Rice, the exact location of his dwelling place is not known, but we do know that it was not this two-story structure that we have restored. We know this because dendrochronology dates the dog trot's construction to 1833, and yet in 1815 William Looney was all over all the tax records and official records and documents of the day. So the family had to have lived somewhere besides in this structure prior to that time. And to support that, archaeological discoveries from ex uh, excavations showed that the based on the items that they found um, they concluded that that building had not served as a dwelling place prior to the time of the Civil War and William Looney died in 1846 so when we put all these evidences together um, uh, along with the family lore um, we believe that that structure served as a distillery and as a tavern and uh, it's located right on the banks almost of the river, just a stone's throw away from a natural ford. I mean, it, it's so much evidence points to that use. So one thing we do know is when he died in 1846, his estate included 13 African-American slaves. And if, I think you can probably read it. We can see their names. We can even see their ages. We'll talk a, a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, at his death, the structure passed to his wife, and she lived about another year. And then it passed to their son, William S. Looney, and his wife, Catherine Looney. Um, so the house now is in the ownership of 
William Looney's son. But then when he died, Catherine Looney remarried, this time a Civil War officer named Dennis Downey. And so with that marriage, ownership of this structure, which at about that time had become a dwelling place, actually passed into the ownership of the Downey family. Many, many generations of Downeys would retain and take care of this property for the next one and a half centuries almost, even digging and constructing this singular, beautifully crafted stone cellar underneath one of the two pins of the dog trot. We initially thought that that was original to the structure and then we learned no, that we even learned the man who constructed it after the house was already, you know, the structure was already there. And uh, it was dug in about 1870. So the Downey family descendants came to count the Downey place as a place where they, through the years, would return and reminisce and pass on to their children stories about Grandma Catherine and the bear. And um, even after the old house was empty, it, it still remained in Randolph County known largely as the Downey place. But then eventually, in roughly the 1970s or so, Christina French, who is a descendant both of Reuben Rice and William Looney, and her husband, Jack French, acquired that property in a farm purchase, returning the structure, and she had always kept up with it through her family, whose massive logs now were enclosed in that siding, it returned that structure to the lineage of those early immigrants. I think that's a neat part of the story. And um, the story of Catherine and Dennis Downey, that's a whole chapter in and of itself that uh, one day, if you ever have a chance, you might want to explore. The restoration processes themselves, I want to look at that because they're really quite incredible, I think. In the case of the Rice Upshaw House, the structure was literally tottering on a few stacked stones. If you look at that bottom picture, I mean, it's just tottering. And this is a drawing of one of those students that really shows uh, how poorly supported the Rice Upshaw house was. And this meant there wasn't sufficient space between the floor and the ground to allow for the foundation work. And besides that, there was a lot of information to be gleaned from the earth, like what, what artifacts had dropped through the literal cracks and where had the porch actually been and was the chimney original. Our historic architect, Tommy Jamison of Little Rock, was also a key player without whom we could not have undertaken this project. He, as well as uh, the craftsmen in this multidisciplinary project, decided to insert a sort of custom-made jack of beams underneath the structure uh, and to secure it and then to lift it several feet above the ground. We very affectionately called it our flying rice. It was quite a sight and, and as you can see once this was done this allowed the archaeologist and the stonemason to really go to work. And these are just assorted images of that. Working on the, uh, uh, the putting down a new foundation and, and restoring that chimney, and all kinds of work. And this, it was during this phase that we came to realize, because of architectural uh, discoveries, that that had not begun as a two-story structure. It had begun only as a tiny one-room, one-story uh, structure. And, and that was a big part of our realization that it was not originally a dwelling place. These are images of the, of the workmen repairing the logs. Uh, in the lower, um, lower left corner, uh, this is, um, um, he's working on the flooring there, a procedure that you don't see very often uh, with, with planks laid opposite each other. And we discovered that the porch 
that existed was not the original porch. The, there had been a porch on the other side, and this was discovered through the drip line testing that the uh, um, archaeologists are able to do. And then finally, all seasons passed. Finally, the structure was put back on stone piers and the log repair and the log replacement could continue. Here he's working on the chinking and the daubing on the interior of the house. And also um, work began on restoration of the smokehouse and, and the granary, the small outbuildings that also date to the 1840s. Um, which again is when we think this structure became a dwelling place for Thomas Blackman Rice. Here's the smokehouse construction and then finally the house is, is completed. And eventually a fence including a paling fence in the front yard which would have been present to um, keep the chickens out of the uh, immediate yard. And now the William Looney Tavern, the much larger two-story dog trot. This structure featured two chimneys in need of repair, many deteriorated logs in that stone cellar. And in this instance, the architect and the craftsman decided to, partly they were prompted by safety concerns because they feared as they removed those logs that those stone chimneys would fall and someone would be hurt and also more damage would occur. So what they decided to do was to cut the roof and top story flooring into three parts to remove these intact, set them off in the field, and then to totally dismantle the balance of the structure so that the deteriorated logs could either be properly repaired and reused or replaced altogether. The entire process of disassembly and reconstruction and repositioning the roof sections we captured from start to finish on a time-lapse photography camera mounted on a pole uh, near the house snapping a picture every six minutes. And it's fascinating to watch that time-lapse and to see that house go up and down. This man here is Eric Salmon. He is a log specialist and he is a true craftsman out of uh, Mountain Home, I believe it is, the Mountain Home area is where he lives. But it was fascinating to watch. Uh, also, the, that method of restoration allowed for extensive archaeological investigation beneath the house, which is, of course, is how we came to understand it does, did not serve as a dwelling until the Civil War era. And so these are just a few other shots. You see the uh, shingles extending over the top there. That's a a technique, it's called the turkey feather. That's right, isn't it? I sometimes get call it a chicken feather, but it's a turkey feather. And it's uh, environmentally to channel the wind and the rain up and over. And, and yeah. Um, so, um, uh, rain, snow, whatever. Uh, this is the room where we believe William Looney had his uh, financial enterprise and uh, the pin on the opposite end is where we believe the distillery was located. And you can see the craftsmanship on this was really quite good. And here's, a, here's a look at it today with the, with the signage out front. Um, in, case, in the case of both of these structures, the superior craftsmanship we think is due to the knowledge of Eric Sammons, who we think is just terrific as a log specialist and also um, our architect Tommy Jamison and both of these structures have won awards from uh, Historic Preservation Alliance of Arkansas. Now, discoveries and yet more questions. The restoration gave birth to the discovery of hundreds of artifacts. Pottery shards, building materials, aren't, aren't those gorgeous? And, um, we actually engaged some students in a pottery project at a local potter shop reproducing pieces of pottery and so we've continued to be able to connect this to student learning in some pretty unique ways. Um, these are some of the, the samples that were recovered at the Rice Upshaw House. The little item 
to your right is a an, really a neat little shot shot mold. And there's Tommy Jameson displaying some of the weaving materials and items that were found there. All these artifacts. In addition to these, we acquired um, this huge loom stored on the rafters in the Rice House for many, 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 many years. And we have put it back together and it, it's, it's almost a room size, just a massive item. And then, um, yeah, these are all pieces of that that were stored in the attic of the Rice House. We also acquired this corner cupboard, which uh, may have been built by slaves according to family tradition. The spinning wheel which came on that 1812 wagon train. Now that, that was actually in the possession of the individual who donated that house to us. So, and she has very carefully kept up with that. And then this is the original rope bed on which we, um, replic which we replicated in that other one that you've seen. Academic studies born in this project have also um, given us a good bit of understanding about a truly fascinating part of our heritage, and that is the African-American heritage in present-day Randolph County. Some of this we, we owe to historic documents retrieved by Joan Gould and then followed up by research by, for example, Dr. Eric Provostine in his dis dissertation. And uh, this is one of the things that he had to say that I, I found really interesting about the story of settlement uh, in the Eleven Point River and the fact that um, in this instance that the uh, slaves of the yeoman farmers participated alongside each other in all aspects of clearing land, establishing farmsteads, and planting one of the state's earliest seedbeds of agricultural heritage. They worked alongside the slave owners and performed the same tasks. And uh, it may be that these skills would have served them well following emancipation when they were able to establish independent homesteads. Historian Ronnie Nichols, a native Arkansan, came and visited and, and uh, studied with us and helped us also. And he agrees with this, with this position. And it, it seems um, this is true. Um, Small-scale slaveholding is an area of history that we don't see um, studied as extensively as, as maybe it could be and maybe it will be. And I think we see this illustrated in this wonderful piece of art from, um, if, you, if you ever want to look at some more, more on this, we have a website. I'll give you that in a moment, but this piece of art appears on that website along with the, um, the artist, which I'm using with permission. Well, as a result from the research which has emanated from REACH, we do now have an, an idea of the number of slaves in Davidson Township and which of the landowners were also slaveholders, how many slaves each one of them had based on census data beginning in 1829. We have had untold groups of people visit these sites, including slave descendants of um, William, William Looney, the slaves who were from the household of William Looney. And we have many African Americans today who, um, who are great supporters of this project and are active at the Eddie May Heron Center that I was telling you guys about. It's a museum in Pocahontas that I encourage you to visit. And we're working together with them. They have exhibits also of the, of the slaves in the county in the area. So even though we've learned a lot, we still have much more to know. Uh, for example, we learned about a slave named Hiram Looney. His name appears on the 1870 census um, of the current River Township. But on the 1880 census, he's listed as being back in Davidson Township. He was one of the former slaves of William Looney. And apparently after the Civil War, 
He established a post-emancipation settlement on land near the Looney Farmstead, and he apparently returned to the area where he had spent most of his life because this is where his tombstone is located, just on land adjoining the current Looney Tavern, but it was a part of that original farmstead. So he, he came back for whatever reason. He didn't, uh, um, and this, the practice was that the slaves were rented, their, their labor was rented to other farmers in the area. That was a big part of the income producing. Um, there's so much more to learn. It's our hope that this project, which has been a window to the past, will provide an opening that will encourage and empower others to reach further into our story so that the Rice Upshaw House and the William Looney Tavern can continue teaching us about us. Thank you all very much.